the mission for diversity within corporations, within organizations is yes, ethnic and racial diversity, diversity of religion, diversity within gender Mm -hmm. and then sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. But it's also the root of it is diversity in perspective and thought. And if you didn't have your dad being there, you wouldn't have that diverse perspective. You you don't need to surround yourself by champions. Everyone, yes, Jordan, yes, absolutely. You're absolutely right. Right. You need to surround yourself with a diversity in perspective Mm -hmm. in order to keep, keep moving forward. Welcome to the Diverse Network Podcast. Thank you everyone for joining me today. Through the podcast, we help discover and support multicultural leaders, executives, and entrepreneurs. I want people to move in a way that is gonna inspire them to keep moving. Whatever gets that heart rate up, just do it. It'll lead to more things. My definition of network is this. If you called me and asked me for something, I would do it just because of our relationship. Mm. If I called you, and ask you for something, you would do it just because of our relationship. It's just a, sure, I can help you out with that because you asked me. Learn how they use a mindset of growth to overcome adversity in the midst of change. Welcome to the Diverse Network Podcast. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Through the podcast, we help discover and support multicultural leaders, executives, and entrepreneurs learn how to use a mindset of growth to overcome adversity in the midst of change. Coming from the podcast studio here at the Sycamore, today I get to welcome retail executive Lisa DiPirio. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Jordan, for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you've been enjoying these podcasts, make sure you hit the like, subscribe, and follow button to learn more and to watch us on YouTube and listen to us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Lisa, I am really looking forward to our conversation. We've had phenomenal uh, conversations in the past over coffee. And by the way, shout out to Karen Hewitt for connecting us, our good friend. So thank you, Karen, so much for connecting us. And again, that's just the beauty of the network, Mm -hmm. being able to build relationships rooted in trust and not necessarily knowing where it's going to go right at the beginning, but just having a mindset to like, hey, how can we help each other out And what can we do to collaborate in the future? And so here we are sitting down on a podcast, excited to share your story. So tell us a little bit more about you. How did you go out from growing up in Buffalo to coming to Columbus, Ohio, to now becoming a retail executive and entrepreneur? Um, So that's a great question, uh, Jordan. So I was born in Buffalo, New York um, to two Filipino immigrants. Uh, You know, Buffalo is a really homogenous um, a really homogenous community with not a lot of brown families. Uh, my dad worked two jobs, and my mom worked at a school and raised three kids, all within born within three years of each other. Wow. So she's a superwoman. Oh my! Um, and you know, my parents wore a lot of hats. My dad also decided to start a t-shirt. Uh, a t-shirt store in a mall in my teens. Wow. And I think that really sparked my interest in retail. Like what t-shirts sold, why didn't they, or which ones sold and which ones didn't, which slogans worked, which didn't. And um, I think that really sparked my curiosity. But all through college, I was was an international relations major. I thought I was going to go to law school. And um, my roommate in my senior year um, said she got a job as an assistant buyer at Bloomingdale's. And I was like, what? And she started telling me about it. I'm like, that's a job. That sounds incredible. Um, So I decided to put law school on hold for a year and uh, try a a job in retail. And I moved to Columbus, Ohio to work uh, for an apparel retailer here as an assistant buyer. And 20 years later, I'm still in retail and and in Columbus. Wow. That's a, that's a phenomenal journey. Just how like you were able to learn lots from your, your parents, Mm -hmm. uh, being entrepreneurs, being immigrants, which shout out to all immigrants. I mean, it's hard enough to, you know, start your own, uh, adulting and career Mm -hmm. by yourself here, uh, in your hometown, rather just going to a whole nother country uh, and despite, you know, overcoming all those challenges so that they were able to to successfully do that and raise you on good values. I mean, so shout out to your parents for, for being able to go through all that. Yeah, they're amazing. Like they have um, really sacrificed for us and taught and really shaped who I am today. 
Like it's the lessons that I learned at home and the education that they have provided me to really shape the person I, I am. And I couldn't be thankful and grateful enough to them. Yeah. Yeah. What, what do you feel like was the most important character uh, and personality and values that they instilled in you that made you successful today? That's a great question. I, I would say it's a combination of working hard and humility. Like how do those two work hand in hand? Right. Um, so my, my parents worked hard. They really taught us the value of work at a very young age, shoveling snow from all the way from October through May. <laughs> uh, I, I do think growing up in Buffalo gives you grit. Oh, I uh, bet. I bet. I always see the snowstorms that they have. I mean, just inches 12 14 inches of snow yes and we had a long driveway so that was oh that, that, that taught that taught us a lot growing up and i think that yeah. uh, really helped like develop how much grit i have today mm -hmm. but they always stress the importance of working hard but also being humble about yeah. it because there's always ways you can do it better right. there's people who can teach you on how to do it better and really how do you just reflect yeah reflect on the work you do to improve the lives of your family and mm -hmm. your friends and your community. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. And and one thing that I realized, Lisa, that's really hard, especially with humility and hard work, is it doesn't stop, right? The hard work, that doesn't stop. You'll be grinding all the way until you're retired or older. There's always some new challenges that you can overcome. But one thing that's really hard that I, I found out the hard way for myself is when you get to a certain place, uh, and achieve certain levels in life and, and achieve certain careers, titles, uh, money, financial status, whatever it may be, that sometimes your ego likes to peek out and be, it's, it's hard to tame the ego. It's hard to tame the pride mm -hmm. and to be humble. How have you been able to maintain that humility throughout your life, despite all the success that you have had, mm -hmm. which I'm sure a lot of others, it's very easy to lose the humble beginnings part. So, like I said, my parents have wore a lot of multiple hats growing up. And um, one of those hats is that they were really uh, committed to community service. So they served a lot of uh, impoverished communities, handing out medical supplies in Buffalo. But that medical missionary work was also one of their key um, uh, key values. Yeah. And that's something that they introduced us to. Wow. So I think just recentering and regrounding not only with the community that you're living in, but also your broader community where you might have a cultural heritage to yeah. is super important because there there's so much that we had growing up mm. and um, just to see what other people don't have yeah. really puts a different perspective on how you live your life and how my parents taught us to live our life. Oh, I love that. Just having a heart to serve and to know that there's always someone out there that, that needs help. Mm -hmm. um, and to be able to get outside of our world, outside of our bubble, like how important that is to like physically leave your hometown or your bubble mm -hmm. or where you live and go into places that are underserved that mm -hmm. actually need help. Mm -hmm. That's a great, I, I love how you have that heart and that mindset. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think too, is that, as I think back, just the I've had the ability to travel, travel to different countries okay. and like just exploring those cultures, but also seeing how people live. Yeah. Like what I may value in my life is not necessarily the same values of a, a woman in a professional career in another country. Right. So just understanding those other perspectives help you gain more perspective for your life. Oh, that's so good. Oh, yes. Travel. I, I love traveling. <laughs> We're definitely going to get into that because you've been to some amazing places. But before we uh, tap into just your travel journey, uh, tell us a little bit more about Buffalo. Like you said, very homogenous. But I want to know what is the, the most amount of snow that you've <laughs> seen in your life? Because the most amount that I've seen here in Columbus is probably about 12 inches, which is a lot. Um, eight to 12 inches, probably right in the, right around in that range, but I haven't seen anything over 12. What is the most amount of snow that you've seen in your life? Oh, um, at least like three feet, three feet or four feet tall, because I remember having to dig out my dad's car with our shovel that was parked. The car was parked in the driveway yeah. and completely snowed in. We were digging that car off. So that was about three feet. Oh my gosh. Like the whole car was just <laughs> yeah, covered was in covered. snow. Oh my gosh. Wow. Snow. 
I couldn't imagine that. <laughs> and the, there, it makes sense why you have some grit and also uh, why Columbus is a little bit better winter-wise. It's yeah. not that bad, uh, even though we complain about it uh, here. And how many siblings do you have? Um, I have two siblings. I have an older brother and an older sister. Okay. I said, but yeah. the baby. Okay. The okay. Baby. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the middle child, so I, I can resonate with, with uh, your siblings there, but... Um, I love having siblings and I think that also, again, makes you just who you are today. So, uh, out of that, where did you go from Buffalo? Tell, tell us a little bit more about all the places that you've traveled to. Um, so I studied one of our previous conversations was about, um, Japan and now I have a really, uh, a spot in my heart for Japan. Um, I had the opportunity to study abroad there. So, I was in Tokyo for three months, and then I lived with a homestay family for four months in Kyoto, which was unbelievable and just such a privilege to be able to be enveloped and welcomed into that community. Um, my homestay family is fantastic, and I still keep in touch with some of them. Uh, really? Today. Yeah. Oh my gosh! Wow, that's that's amazing. And that was just a, just a couple years ago. It wasn't that long? It wasn't that long ago? <laughs> yeah. But what what about? Japan and the culture and the people that really stuck out to you that you just really grew a love for Japan and the Japanese culture? I think um, as I, I look back even to my own Filipino heritage and Filipino culture, the food is the center point of my family and how we connect. Like we break bread, but every every occasion is surrounded by food. What are you bringing? What is she bringing? Okay, let's, let's all get together. Yeah. And um, um, I think it was just a really important way for our community to get together. And I was introduced to a variety of different foods growing up, even living in Buffalo, J Japanese food being one of them. So there was always that um, pull and love from um, from the start of when I was when I was a child. But it, it's just this beautiful culture with a rich history, mm -hmm. but is so advanced technological right. technologically. And it's how they blend together yeah. and how that comes together harmoniously that I find really fascinating. Right, right. And and I, the, what I love about the Japanese culture, because for me here in Columbus, Ohio, there's not a lot of that community here. Uh, we have the Japanese marketplace, which is great because then that, that was how I was able to you know get a taste of, of home for me. Um, and obviously being born and raised here in Columbus, Ohio, uh, I really didn't get to know that side. And so for me, it was times I went to Seattle, but most importantly, when I traveled to Japan as well, that I was like, oh, this is what it means to be Japanese with the cleanliness, the honor, the respect, mm -hmm. uh, the culture, like you said, the food, the food is just, just mm -hmm. everywhere. You know, the noodles, <laughs> the rice, the dishes, everything. Like I absolutely loved it. And it was at that point for me that it just made so much sense. It's like, this is the reason why my family is the way we are because of this is the culture. And, you know, growing up, I was just known as like the Asian kid, but going to Japan, gave me a sense of pride. Like I am proud to be Japanese and mm -hmm. for those reasons. So I, I, I love, love hearing stories about that. Yeah. And I think too, it was the first time I went back to the Philippines with my family and my mm. parents where I like understood, Oh, this makes more sense. Like there's this, this unspoken understanding and realization that I got when I went back to the Philippines for the first time with my parents. And I think I was I was similar to you. Like I, I was growing up in Buffalo, like there were a lot of Asian kids yeah. in school. And you know, it was as I reflect back, like it was like it, it was hard. Like it, yeah. there were there were hard moments and um you asked about my siblings. Yeah. And I would say that uh, my siblings really helped me mm. and helped me um find my voice, I would yeah. say. Like, I, I, I adored my brother growing up. Aww. And uh, I still, he's awesome. He's like yeah. one of the coolest people I know today. And I remember from telling, I, I remember from telling, I tell, me telling him um, like this really hard time when I was in second grade of, this sounds crazy, but it's the same year that the movie Karate Kid came yeah. out. Okay, okay. And um, it was like the biggest thing. And yeah. everyone kept pestering me that, Oh, aren't you Japanese? Where are your chopsticks? Do you mm. know karate? And it was, and I'm like, no, I, I'm Filipino. Like, what are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah. But it was so hard. And like, they were pestering and pestering and pestering. Mm. And I remember telling my brother the story. And he says to me, you know what you tell them? The only words you know 
in Japanese are F you. I was like, why? Why can't you say that? No. Are you kidding? Like, we don't, we don't swear. We right, don't right, curse growing right, up. Right, but like, right. It was the moment that I feel like I started to find like my voice yeah. of like, of no, like saying proudly. Yes. No, I am Filipino. Yes. And here's a little bit about myself. Yeah. And of yeah. course my mom, the pacifier and who is food centric was like, why don't you bring in these dried mangoes for your classroom yeah. and, right, right. And, <laughs> and, and, and tell them about the Filipino culture. Yeah. But I don't know. It was, um, it was like moments like that, that um, mm. I, I think about that, how, um, my brother yeah. helped me find my voice. My mom, the pacifier, helped me connect and, yeah. and build bridges with the oh, people. That's great. And, and a lot of kids, they just, what's unfamiliar to them, uh, they just don't know what mm-hmm. they don't know. And it's, it's bad, but they assume like all Asians are the same. We're not, mm-hmm. you know. The Filipinos, you have a very, uh, uh, you mix with, with the Spanish culture because mm-hmm. that's who colonized the Philippines, right? Mm-hmm. And same well, with Vietnam, they have a big French presence because French colonized the Philipp- or the Vietnam. And so and with Japan, like you said, they have a rich history. It's very different from the Chinese. Mm-hmm. And our foods are different. Uh, our rice is even different too. Uh, but being able to understand and, and be proud of your culture and, hey, let me help educate others. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing that I've had to learn, because I realized like growing up, I had a chip on my shoulder uh, from all the times that that happened or the jokes that were made uh, or the looks that I got when I bring in sushi or salmon or what people like, like, ew, what are you eating? You're eating like raw fish. Mm-hmm. And well, now look at where sushi is. You know, everyone's eating sushi. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a trend. It's, it's in. Um, but it's those times that I had to essentially give grace and forgiveness and heal that inner child that, that needed it at that moment. Uh, instead of just carrying that with me. And I just had to realize like they just didn't know and it was mm-hmm. just unfamiliar to them. However, me learning about my family, my history, my culture, like what you said, just gave me a sense of pride. Like I'm proud to be Japanese mm-hmm. and there's very stark differences with all the Asian mm-hmm. cultures, but it's important to know that. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I even, I have a four-year-old daughter and um, I packed her seaweed snacks because she likes seaweed, like nori uh-huh. paper. Yeah. And even the teacher said to me, what is that? And I was like, oh, it, it's just seaweed paper. It's like what you find in sushi. And so she's like, I was like, would you like to try some? I'll bring you a pack tomorrow. And the yeah. teacher tried it and she's like, this is great. It's, yeah. I think people genuinely do want to learn yeah. and want to know. And I think it's just how do you meet? Mm. And um, like, how do you, how do you just meet? Right, right. Oh. And you got to do it with love too, mm-hmm. you know, because sometimes they'll have uh, unconscious bias, right? Mm-hmm. Um, or they'll give a look that they don't know that they're giving off. Yeah. Like, ew, see, you're eating seaweed. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But I'm like, now I think we're, we're in a place where people are a little bit more willing to be uh, adventurous mm-hmm. to at least try it. If you try it and don't like it, that's cool. Yeah. But you, unless you try it, you can't say anything. And that's always my thing. Like if you, you can't say ew, if you don't try it. And I even tell my younger sister this, cause she's a little picky. I said, Lauren, you can't say it's disgusting or ew if you haven't tried it. If you tried it and then say that, okay, given, you know, you just don't like it, but you have at least have to try it, right? Yes. I completely agree with you. Like that is one thing we're trying to teach her with our four-year-old. Just, just even the smallest bite, give it a try and you know, we respect your decision if you don't like it. Right, right. But even having that type of mindset, uh, just being open, right? Open to trying new things. Mm -hmm. Like how that leads people to experiencing a new world Mm -hmm. and having their mind open to different things or ideas that they haven't been exposed to. And how that mindset is so crucial to having success, especially when the world is uncertain or changing rapidly Mm -hmm. as we know it. How have you been able to use a mindset of growth to really overcome adversity in the midst of change in in your life and in your your career? You know, I would say for the last like three years, everyone has going through like a new reality, right? With COVID, work from home and, um, even just of the late being in retail, like there has been a lot of changes like Mm -hmm. in how we operate. And I would say, as I reflect back, even in the last like six to nine months, 
retail has changed so significantly to the point where I had a lot of great <clears throat> friends who recently lost their job. Wow. And, um, you know, it, it was it was hard. It's hard just seeing what they're going through. A lot of them are the sole breadwinners of their family, mm. taking care of multiple children and taking care of their parents. And just seeing that hardship and just figuring out how can I help? Yeah. Like, how can I help connect you to, to this person? Or how can I help um, uh, connect you to a company that right. you may be interested in? And, you know, it was it was really hard for me yeah. because... While I felt gratitude that I still had my job, I was yeah. seeing my closest friends mm. go through that hardship. And it really made me think like they have the means and they have the disposable income and they're all in great places now. I'm, yeah. I'm really happy to say it made me really think about the people who don't have those resources, right. who don't have the means to um, find jobs or find um, those right connections to yeah. get those jobs. Um, so it put me in a different path. So. Yeah. I ended up um, uh, getting connected with Goodwill Columbus, okay. and uh, they're a phenomenal organization. Yeah, and I would say they're more than just a thrift store. Like I remember in high school, that's where I first bought my first like leather jacket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, they do so much for the community above wow. and beyond um, all the repurpose and reuse that they have for yeah. um, all their clothing. Like they are all about job training mm. and also about finding and placing people to jobs either with people with disabilities or people who have other barriers of entry into yeah. the workforce. So yeah. I feel like through that experience going through it with my friends, it I found a bigger purpose for myself of what I want to contribute to. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Cause I'm sure, you know, there's a lot of people out there going through job changes, especially in the last three years. Mm -hmm. First was COVID, and now we have this upcoming recession, which I feel like we're, we're in. I don't know how much worse it's going to get, but right now it's, it's still not looking good. Um, there's a lot of people that have been laid off, let mm -hmm. go over the last three years. Uh, and so being able to support them and find ways, okay, what, what is it that you need? Uh, mm -hmm. Do you need somebody to help prep you for an interview? Mm -hmm. Do you need me to look over your resume? Uh, can we help update your resume um, and doing it for a certain job? Mm -hmm. You know, is there a company like what you said uh, that you're looking at or a certain job that you're looking at? Maybe I know somebody that's in there. Mm -hmm. Better yet, maybe I know the hiring manager. Maybe I know the recruiting manager. Mm -hmm. And maybe I can connect you, at least put a good word in to say, hey, you know, I have a good friend that's looking for a job. These are, This is their resume. This is the job that they're looking for. Uh, do you mind setting up a, just a conversation just to kind of help them out? Mm -hmm. it, just doing something like that mm -hmm. goes such a long way mm -hmm. for the people that need just help, you know, in this mm -hmm. certain time. They, it, it's so overwhelming. And uh, that's what I love about Diverse Network because that's the reason why we are, uh, we were created was for those reasons, for, was for those people to be able to help those people out. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And I just think that the small things that you think are small, to your point, are so meaningful and have so much impact to the people that you're helping. Yeah. And I think if everyone, if, if a lot of people can do a lot of small things, a lot of big things can happen. Mm. So it's just, it really had made me reflect of what, what do I want my purpose to be? Like, how can yeah. I do more yeah. um, within the community? So I'm really happy to serve on um, the board of Goodwill. Oh, that's awesome. Let's yeah. go. <laughs> you know, we definitely we need more, more uh, diversity on the boards, you know, and that's a huge thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, that I'm seeing, and a lot of people have been asking me that question, like, Jordan, you know, what do we do to increase diversity, not only in the workplace, but at the C levels and at the board levels, mm -hmm. which I think, you know, it's a long term solution to that mm -hmm. because it's partly you got to focus on the talent pipeline and are you developing the talents uh, enough so when the opportunity comes that they can take advantage mm -hmm. of that. But what, what would you say from your perspective, you know, one, how did you get that opportunity to be on the board? And two, what does that look like about opening up the door for other people to sit at the table? You know, that's a really great question. So I think boards and also corporations now look to find diverse candidates. And at times it's always the question of, well, there's no pool. And that's not good enough. Like that's not a good enough reason. And, um, you had mentioned Karen Hewitt in the very beginning from Leadership Columbus, and um, I went to one of her uh, talks, and she had a really great nugget that said, 
It's not the lack of pool of diverse talent. It's a lack of the connection and the network to those diverse professionals. So how do you create a bridge and how do you create that network of the diverse candidates to the roles um, that need to be filled within the board and the, and the corporation. Yeah. So I love what you do at Diverse Network of connecting people. Mm-hmm. How do you connect people to the opportunities, to the right companies and the yeah. right jobs and continue to foster that relationship building, I think is is super critical and important. Yeah, yeah. And, and I love uh, just what J- Karen talked about. Like you got to be able to go out and find that talent. Mm-hmm. And one thing that I'll kind of challenge all recruiters or just people in the professional space, one, you got to continue building your network. Uh, if you have an establ- established network, that's great. Mm-hmm. Continue expanding it. Look at who's in your network and more importantly, who's not in your network, right? Do you have, are, is your industry, do you have just one industry in your network, the one that you work for? Like for you, mm-hmm. like do you just have retail people in your network and not connected to like IT people or venture capitalists or entrepreneurs, yes. et cetera, diverse in that way? Uh, what about the age range? Like do you have older people? Do you have younger people, young professionals, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, both in your network. So I think diversity goes beyond just race and mm-hmm. ethnicity. Uh, it goes like you talked about neurodiversity. Do you have people who um, are on the spectrum or have special needs that are in your network as well? How are they getting access to opportunities uh, to be successful? Because they're very smart and very intelligent and they have uh, a certain way of going about doing things. So it's just different than us. And that's just what diversity is, is. And that's what the beauty lies within is that we're all different. Diversity is just what makes us different. Mm-hmm. What's beautiful about diversity is that it inlo- unlocks innovation mm-hmm. and innovation solves problems. So because diversity unlocks innovation, we have so many different perspectives sitting at the table mm-hmm. that you have new ideas brought to the table uh, because you may not have seen that or had a blind spot. And like, wow, I did not uh, see that. And, well, let's do it. Let, let's let's share that idea and let's go for it. Uh, and that's what I love. And, and being able to challenge people to say, hey, you know, what does your friend group look like? Yeah. Is your friend group diverse, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and if not, well, then you need, you need to start exploring some new opportunities and it's uncomfortable. Yes, I get it. That's the biggest thing because we stick to what's comfortable. But that's the challenge. Can you get uncomfortable and become comfortable mm-hmm. being uncomfortable? And can you go out into new spaces, meet new friends, get access to these new networks? That way you're then finding diverse talent and finding talent outside of your initial network that you had. Mm-hmm. No, I love that. And it's, it, you're right. It's about being uncomfortable for a moment, right? But like pushing yourself to be uncomfortable. And I also think it goes back to that level of like curiosity. Like, mm. like how do you push yourself to be more curious? Yeah. Like more curious to meet a new person, more curious to meet someone out of your industry, more curious to meet somebody who is does not look like you and connect with them. So right. I think it also lends itself to like, how, how do you push yourself yeah. on being yeah. more curious? Because I do think like diversity and understanding diversity, it, it's continued education, right? It's a continued education course that you keep on learning and you keep refining and you keep, you just keep learning yeah. and you have to have that openness. And it's something that I am still working on, like Absolutely. in my path of like, how do I keep learning Yeah, and it being wanting to keep learning? Yes. Oh, that's it. That's the key right there. Cause a lot of people, when they get comfortable, they just, they, they don't want to stay there. Right. And you get complacent. And the, the, the first moment that you need to understand is that you don't know everything and there's so much more to learn mm-hmm. uh, that if you become a lifelong learner, you will always find success in that way because mm-hmm. there's always, like you said, someone new, something new that's coming out. Uh, Technology is always advancing and always evolving. We have artificial intelligence that is here right now. And so it's going faster than we can un- even understand. There's, I know s- some people, the older generation doesn't even understand phones. And so it's like, how do you understand artificial intelligence? And so that's what I f- feel like is the beauty and diversity is because the younger generation can then talk to the older generation and teach the older generation. And at the same time, what we typically know uh, is that reaching out to your elders, can they 
give that experience and knowledge. But I think, like you said, it's both ways. Mm -hmm. It goes both ways that you're never too old to start or to learn, and you're never too young uh, to then reach out and connect with someone uh, who doesn't look like you or who is Mm -hmm. outside of your industry or outside of your age range, uh, because you will definitely pick up some new opportunities and and some new things that you'll learn. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. I think like the biggest... um uh, saying that always throws up a red flag for me is when they, when I hear this saying, Oh, they're just stuck in their ways. And I'm oh. like, Oh, well, that's, that's not great for them. Yeah. That's not great for their family or their friends or their community that they live in yeah. because you can't be stuck. Like yeah. things are moving so quickly. Like you mentioned with AI, with how the world is changing, like yeah. you cannot be stuck. Right. And, and if you're stuck, please don't bring everyone else and be stuck with them. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Or, or that's just who I am. Mm-hmm. Like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. I, I, once I, once I got into this mindset and you start noticing, okay, how does someone, does someone have a growth mindset or a fixed mindset? You start hearing certain things like, Oh, I can't do this because of so-and-so or, you know, whatever it may be limiting yourself as well as, well, that's just who I am. And that's how I'll always be. I'm like, ah, oh. No, you don't always have to be that way. You can change and mm-hmm. grow and develop and become new. Mm-hmm. 